And my name is Gerard Tui. Um, I'm the pharmacist in charge of the Valley Health Pharmacy in Mawa. Uh, for those who, for those of you who are familiar, um, Valley actually owns and operates three retail pharmacies. There's one in Paramus of Aleko Pavilion, one in the actual hospital in Ridgewood, and I am located up in the Lifestyle Center on MacArthur Boulevard um, in Mawa. We're open to the public, so anyone is more than free to stop in and speak to me at any time they feel when their time when their schedule allows. Okay, so what is vitamin D? It's often referred to as the sunshine vitamin. Ideally, the body would be able to create enough vitamin D from any sunshine from any exposure to the sun. Usually they recommend between two to five days a week for five to 30 minutes. Um, vitamin D is considered a fat soluble vitamin. That means it can be stored in the body's fat tissue for an extended time. Vitamin A, D, E, and K are what are, are, what are called your fat soluble vitamins. Vitamin B and C are water soluble. What that means is B and C will get flushed out of the body a lot sooner um, and vitamin D gets stored in the body's fat tissue. And we, we when we use the term vitamin D, it's really a generic term because it exists as two forms. There's vitamin D2 and there's also vitamin D3. Uh, for purposes of the lecture tonight, more often than not, we'll be referring to vitamin D3 because those are the supplements that you get over the counter. But vitamin D2 is a prescription item which a lot of people do take. So what are the differences between D2 and D3? So D2 comes from your plant-based sources that's usually um, predominant in mushrooms, different types of yeast. Vitamin three comes from animal-based sources, usually comes from different types of fatty fish and liver um, is the primary beef source of vitamin D3. Vitamin D2 gives you moderate levels in the body, whereas vitamin D3 gives you higher vitamin D levels. It's more bioavailable, meaning that you don't have to take as much to get higher levels in the body. Um, vitamin D2, like I mentioned before, there's 50,000 unit capsules, which is pretty popular. Some people will take that once a week, twice a week, depending on whatever condition they're taking. Um, the vitamin D3, that's as your over-the-counter supplements, come anywhere between 400, 800, 1,000, 2,000, 5,000 units. Um, they come as capsules, tablets, soft gels. Um, those are your vitamin threes. Also, the vitamin D that's in combination with your different calciums like caltrate or citrocal would be vitamin D3 as well. Also, from the sun, we get ultraviolet B rays. Your body produces vitamin D3 from that sunlight. Okay, so this slide is very intimidating to look at, especially when you see all the organic chemistry. But the takeaway slot, the takeaway I want you to get from this slide is that no matter where you're getting your vitamin D, whether you're getting it from the sun, whether you're getting it from the diet, whether that's your foods, your supplements, um, it has to be metabolized twice before you get actual active vitamin D in the body. So it has to get metabolized by the liver right over here. And then it has to get further metabolized by the kidney before you get to your active vitamin D, T, vitamin D, which is the vitamin D that circulates in the bloodstream. So there's multiple steps in this pathway to get activated vitamin D in the body. Um, just to Vitamin D levels are very variable. And so this is one of the reasons for that. If somebody has impaired liver function, somebody has impaired kidney function, um, somebody doesn't get enough sunlight, somebody doesn't have a poor, uh, someone has a poor diet or somebody is not taking supplements, um, that all can affect different vitamin D levels in the body. So what diseases do we know are caused by low vitamin D? We definitely know two, well, actually we know three. One is osteoporosis. That's where the bones become weak and brittle. That's why we have postmenopausal women and generally elderly will take calcium with vitamin D. And then we also have rickets, which is a softening and weakening of the bones in children. Um, as adults, that condition um, is called osteomalacia, which again would present later on in life where patients, um, non-children, but it's gonna happen in teenage years or middle age or even the elderly, you'll get the softening and weakening of the bones. So you have a lot of people who are very anti-supplement. They don't like to take any pills. They want to do everything naturally. So could you get vitamin D just from your diet and sunlight? It's possible, but it's not likely. Vitamin D, can I just drink milk? Well, it would take you about five quarts of milk to equal 2,000 units in a vitamin D capsule. And also approximately five to 30 minutes of sun exposure between 10 a.m. to 3 p.m., at least twice a week, you would have to get your face, arms, legs, or back without sunscreen usually leads to sufficient vitamin D. So that might be easier to get in the summer 
but in the winter months, it'd be hard to get that kind of sun exposure to us. So how do we get our vitamin D? Well, like I mentioned, sunshine, that's the most natural form. Like I mentioned before, five to 30 minutes between 10 a.m. and 3 p.m. But there's a lot of factors that can affect our vitamin D production, our age. As we get older, we're less efficient at producing vitamin D. Obesity. Now, this might kind of throw people off and say, wait a second, you just mentioned a couple of slides ago, vitamin D is a fat-soluble vitamin. So there'd be more fat stores in the body to store vitamin D, which in theory is true, but we've actually shown that patients who are obese actually have low levels of vitamin D. Um, location, where you are in five to 30 minutes up in New Jersey versus five to 30 minutes in Florida are going to be totally different. Uh, you would get more ultraviolet light from those locations that are closest to the equator. So you may not need to spend as much time in the sunlight or as many days in the sunlight. Uh, skin color also. Um, darker skin, those patients who, those people, that patient population, excuse me, that has a lot of melanin, um, kind of acts as a sun protectant. And so they don't get as much vitamin D as well. Um, also, we've shifted to an indoor generation, especially this past year, but people spend 90% of their lives inside and, very, and spend very few time outside. Um, in terms of diet, where do we get our vitamin D? Oily fish, get salmon, herring, trout, tuna, mackerel, even though a full portion of that would probably only give you about 200 to 250 units of vitamin D. Um, we get it from our egg yolks, get it from mushrooms. Mushrooms, like I said, was our vitamin D2. Um, they Mushrooms also synthesize vitamin D the same way we do from sunlight, um, get it from liver, and we can also get it from cereals. Um, and this diet here is not really a traditional American Western diet. Um, Western diet, we generally eat more meat, more carbs. Um, this is similar to a Mediterranean diet, but even when it comes to different populations throughout the globe, 42% um, of the American population is actually considered vitamin D deficient. And even in Europe, where a lot of people may, oh, sorry. Sorry, the light went off there. Um, even in Europe, where um, more people might adhere to this type of diet, there's actually about 40% of patients that are, 40% of the population is considered vitamin D deficient. Um, we can get it from cereals, oatmeal, Special K, Total, Multigrain Cheerios. Um, there's been an emphasis in the past few years. Um, Kellogg's in 2018 increased their vitamin D levels by 50% in their vitamins in the UK. Um, they've also done that in the United States. And lastly, we also get it from, we also get our vitamin D from supplements. So what's the recommended dose for vitamin D supplements? These are the over-the-counter doses. Um, like I said, they can range from anywhere from 200 up to 5,000, 10,000 units per capsule. Um, assuming adequate sun exposure, any adult under the age of 70 recommend you get about 600 units a day. Um, adults over the age of 70, 800 to 1,000 units a day. For years, this 600 units used to be 400 units, um, but over the past few years, they've recommended you need more vitamin D. Um, patients who have low sun exposure, you can get, um, they recommend 800 to 1,000 units a day. And when you compare vitamin D supplement use, I'm oh, sorry, um, we find that it's higher in women than in men. And that's kind of to be expected because we have a lot of women who you take calcium and vitamin D postmenopausal to treat, um, treat and prevent osteoporosis. And so vitamin D supplement use is more common in the elderly. Also, vitamin D is the number one selling supplement on the market. Um, it has overtaken multivitamins on their own, um, different vitamin C, vitamin C, vitamin E. Vitamin D is the number one selling supplement in the market. And the whole vitamin supplement in general um, averages to about $35 billion in sales a year in the United States alone. So how much should I take? Um, we just went back and we showed you, you should probably need about 600 units a day. This is an old label. The only reason I show this is because you might be getting enough vitamin D in whatever multivitamin you're taking right now. Um, the only thing, this is an old label, like I said, because as you can see here, vitamin D recommends 400 units, 100% daily value. That has since changed. It's now 600 units. But also when you're looking at your label of whatever vitamin you're taking, make sure you're checking the serving size because a lot of people will buy vitamin D and it might come as a gummy, it might come as a chewable, it might come as a fast dissolve. And sometimes the serving size is actually two tablets. So you have to just make sure that what you're taking 
um, corresponds to the amount of vitamin D that you're supposed to be taking. So who are the patients at risk for low levels of vitamin D? Uh, like we mentioned, age, anyone over the age of 50. Newborns, um, newborns do not get vitamin D from breast milk. So babies, as soon as they're, if they're um, being breastfed, will be given vitamin D um, supplements pretty much within a week of being born. Uh, we mentioned obesity, dark skin tone. Um, vegetarians don't really eat meat, well, they don't eat meat or fish. So they're gonna get their vitamin D from plants like mushrooms. So they're at risk. Um, patients with malabsorption syndrome. So this is your patients that have issues with the small intestine. They might've had surgery. They might have celiac disease. Um, they're not getting the proper amount of nutrients absorbed from the vitamin supplements. Um, patients with disorders that affect the metabolism of vitamin D, that was what I had showed you previously, that path where whatever vitamin D you're getting, whether you're getting it from the sun, whether you're getting it from a diet or a supplement, um, it's still gonna be metabolized through the liver, then onto the kidney, and then you get your active vitamin D. Uh, those who have poor diet and those who are homebound, those who are homebound won't be able to go out in the sun and get any vitamin D. So, how do you know you have vitamin D deficiency? Well, it's difficult to identify because the signs and symptoms are common in a variety of other disease states. You see moon changes, bone loss, bone pain, muscle cramps, joint pain, fatigue. I mean, this could describe somebody who just worked out, to be honest with you. So the only way you're really going to know you have vitamin D deficiency is you're going to have to do lab work. That's required for a definitive diagnosis. So your doctor would prescribe or recommend you get this is common with regular blood work anyway. It's called a 25-hydroxy vitamin D test. And so this is the most accurate way to monitor vitamin D levels. This measures the vitamin D that's actually circulating in the body. It won't measure vitamin D that's stored. There's no way we'll be able to figure that out. Um, you would fast four to eight hours normal before blood work. And then depending on when you get your results, you would read them off as optimal. I have a question mark there because this is also a controversial point with vitamin D. What's considered an optimal level of vitamin D? Could be different for different patients, um, different disease state that you might be trying to treat. Um, so we recommend that the optimal level, sometimes we'll say is 50 nanograms per ml, but there are some data that shows it should be up between 60 and 100 nanograms per ml. Um, we can't agree on sufficient. Anything above, uh, above 30 to 30 nanograms per ml is considered sufficient. Insufficient, 21 to 29. And those who are deficient would have blood levels that are less than 20 nanograms per ml. And like I mentioned before, 42% of the US population is considered to be vitamin D deficient. Um, usually you would monitor your vitamin D levels three months after beginning treatment um, to see one, if the vitamin D supplements are the right dose, will you need to increase it? And then they usually monitor it three to six months later. So what does vitamin D do? Well, we know that it helps to maintain calcium and phosphorus levels. That's not up for debate. We know that it increases, it helps get calcium absorbed. Um, so that's why, like I said, most um, postmenopausal women will use it um, in combination with calcium to um, prevent osteoporosis. Um, it does have some anti-inflammatory activity. So that may be why it does help relieve um, some muscle pain. Um, helps regulate glucose metabolism and sensitivity to insulin. So it could be used for diabetics who are type one and type two diabetics. So um, those who are insulin dependent and those non-insulin dependent. Um, antioxidant is a little iffy. Um, there are some people who believe it does have antioxidant activity, others who believe it doesn't have enough. Um, neuroprotective. This is kind of up for debate as well because the data, um, excuse me, with vitamin D, they're using it in different studies for Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, migraines. Um, and the data is still to be determined right now. Um, you do have some studies that do show promise, others that show no benefit. And then also, it inhibits cell growth differentiation. So is it, does it play a role in cancer? We know that vitamin D helps to build natural healthy cells. It works in the DNA of healthy cells. And it's also believed that vitamin D would also stop um, bad cell proliferation or cancer cell proliferation. So what do we have? The proven benefits of vitamin D supplements. We know that it improves bone mineral density and fracture prevention in the elderly and postmenopausal women. This next sentence sounds conflicting, or what I'm, I mean, sounds um, opposite of what I'm just gonna say, what I just said, but there's conflicting data for fracture prevention when combined with calcium supplements. This is only because when Caltrade first came out, 
it was originally calcium plus, it was 600 plus 200 units of vitamin D. Then they brought it up from 600 to 400 units of vitamin D, and then up to 800 units of vitamin D. So the calcium has stayed the same, it's just the vitamin D levels um, have increased through time. And these are studies that are taken, you know, 10, 15, 20 years. Um, these aren't studies that are done within a few months, you know, we're managing studies as the population ages, um, as we get more data. Um, also, it's been shown to reduce falls by improvement in muscle function. And the dose range usually for this is anywhere between 800 to 5,000 units a day. Okay, so this, I went on clinicaltrials.gov about a week or so ago. So there's something to be said for procrastinating when making a presentation. But I Google, I mean, I'm sorry, I searched for vitamin D and as you can see here, there's almost 3,400 studies going on right now on clinicaltrials.gov studying the effects of vitamin D. So I'm sure there's gonna be people who will have questions that I've heard vitamin D is good for this, I heard vitamin D is good for that. And the data might start to indicate that, but we're really not sure exactly. Um, vitamin D is marketed as a food supplement. It's not, it's not marketed as a drug, so it doesn't really have to prove um, safety or efficacy. Obviously, a lot of these drug com a lot of these um, companies want good data behind their vitamin D because, like I said, it's a large um, money maker for these drug companies that um, people are willing to spend money on vitamin D supplements. So they want good data from these studies. But as you can see, there's a lot of studies going on right now um, just with vitamin D alone. So, what are the possible benefits of vitamin D supplements? One, and this is just going through that almost 3,400 studies, may reduce weight gain in postmenopausal women, may reduce relapse risk in Crohn's disease patients. We have been able to pretty much show that low vitamin D levels are associated with a greater risk of mortality, um, may help it with certain neurological diseases, like I mentioned before, studying use in Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, dementia, migraine headaches, may help with certain infectious diseases. There's um, data, whether it's um, beneficial or not to use for patients with upper respiratory infections, tuberculosis, COVID-19, which has become obviously the hot topic. Um, and it may help as a protect preventive agent and as a treatment for different types of cancer. So vitamin D used in breast cancer. Um, in animal studies, now I stress this is animal studies, vitamin three demonstrates chemo preventive effects against breast cancer. So chemo prevent, I don't want um, people to get confused between chemo preventive and chemotherapy. Chemotherapy is where we're giving drugs that are actually targeted for the cancer itself. Chemo preventive is hopefully to try and prevent that cancer from coming in the first place. That would be through either nutrition, diet, um, or supplements. Um, so in humans, vitamin D from the sun and diet may offer protective effects against breast cancer. Again, that's up for debate. We know that five to 30 minutes seems to give enough vitamin D if you get enough exposure to the sun. Question is, how often do you have to do that? Twice a week, five times a week, every day? That's up for debate. Um, studies have shown that many breast cancer survivors were vitamin D deficient. However, the United States population as a whole, 42% of us are vitamin D deficient. So that stat is, um, you can almost take it or leave it. However, there are, show, there, excuse me, there are studies that show doses of 800 units versus 400 units were less likely to develop during breast, were less likely to develop during breast cancer during follow-up. Sorry, I think I have a typo there, um, which is actually a pretty powerful study. So they studied women for five years and those who had taken vitamin D 800 seemed to be less likely to develop breast cancer. However, if somebody develops breast cancer and successfully completes treatment, uh, vitamin D doesn't seem to play a role in decreasing the recurrence of it. So vitamin D use in prostate cancer. We do know that vitamin D improves the pain and muscle strength in patients with advanced hormone refractory prostate cancer. And it does seem to slow the rate of prostate specific antigen. So as that starts to rise, vitamin D does seem to show a blunting effect on that. Um, however, <clears throat> excuse me, there could be a possibility of increasing the risk of aggressive prostate cancer, but this is with very, very, very high vitamin D doses. So um, that's um, something we'll get to later on in the topic, but um, you would really have to take very high levels of vitamin D and it would have to be supplements. It would not be through diet or through the sunlight um, that you would get, um, that you may increase the risk of aggressive prostate cancer. Um, it's also been theorized 
that African American men um, who are 50% more likely to develop breast, I'm sorry, develop prostate cancer and two times as likely to die from prostate cancer, vitamin D might play a role um, due to dark skin and the melanin, which I mentioned before. They may not be able to absorb or get high levels of vitamin D, um, but that's just a theory out there. Uh, vitamin D use in colorectal cancer. So we know in postmenopausal women who do not use estrogen therapy, calcium supplements and vitamin D may reduce the incidence of colorectal cancer. Um, and like we said before, this is similar to the uh, breast cancer. Half of patients diagnosed with colorectal cancer had some vitamin D deficiency. But again, the American population, 42% of us are vitamin D deficient anyway. Um, but there is one study which shows that high dose vitamin D does seem to slow disease progression of metastatic colorectal cancer. It was called the Sunshine Clinical Trial. They had one arm using 4,000 units a day versus another arm using 400 units a day. And those who took the higher dose of vitamin D did seem to so, um, show disease, slow disease progression, excuse me. So vitamin D use in other cancers. So the only way we're really gonna measure our vitamin D levels is like I said, that test that measures our high circulating vitamin D levels. And currently, and I stress at this time, the following cancers do not seem to be affected much with vitamin D, ovarian, or I should say vitamin D deficiency, ovarian cancer, kidney, skin, esophageal, non-Hodgkin lymphoma, esoph um, I have esophageal twice, I apologize for that. But um, this is all can change. Um, like I said, there's over 3,400 ongoing studies right now. And I'm sure if somebody Googles vitamin D and ovarian cancer, there might be some study that shows that there might be some benefit. But as of now, it doesn't seem to um, hold much promise, although I don't want to say that because, um, like I said, anything can change. And high circulating vitamin D levels actually may significantly increase risk of pancreatic or aggressive prostate cancer, like I mentioned before. So what's the takeaway message about vitamin D and cancer? Um, recent meta-analysis regarding vitamin D supplements for cancer prevention indicate there might be decreased cancer mortality. So a meta-analysis is a type of study that looks at a bunch of studies. Um, it kind of comes to like an average, we'll say. Um, there might be 10 or 12 studies going on trying to study the same thing at different locations. So meta-analysis tries to kind of correlate all that data and try and see if there's any trends or if there's any... Um, the word I'm looking for, patterns that um, might show up when you have a large correlation of data. Um, because if you have studies, some of these studies are very small. You have some studies that have 10 patients, 50 patients. You have other studies, studies that have 200, 300 patients. The 300 patients, it might depend on the cancer center, might depend on location, might depend on whether patients enroll or not. So um, what they try and do is they do these meta-analysis studies. So they can try and find, like I said, a weighted average. And then it also kind of We'll, hopefully we'll see some type of patterns or see some type of correspondence with vitamin D and you know the risk and benefits with it. Um, like I said, most studies have a lim limited number of participants. Um, and when you do a meta-analysis, you get more patients, you get more power. So the study, like I said, um, it's just easier to draw some correlations. Um, and more studies are needed to evaluate the effects of vitamin D on different patient populations. Um, like uh, this shouldn't be surprising. Most data is available for cancers that affect older women due to increased usage in this patient population. Um, we do know that older women, like I've said time and time again, have been taking calcium and vitamin D for a long time uh, postmenopausal to prevent osteoporosis, it fractures, you know, um, those types of things. So that patient population we already know is taking vitamin D. Vitamin D has become like the really hot vitamin basically in the last 15 to 20 years or so, um, late 90s, early 2000s, it was vitamin E. Vitamin E was the one that was gonna prevent cancer, was gonna prevent heart disease, was gonna prevent Alzheimer's, and those studies really didn't pan out. So vitamin D has kind of taken its place um, as the hot vitamin. Um, and like I said, if you Google vitamin D and some deficiency with any type of condition, more than likely you'll find some study that will try and prove some type of correlation. Okay, vitamin D use in COVID-19. Okay, so this is an area, if, if cancer is uh, jumbled, vitamin D use in COVID-19 is probably even worse. Um, 
COVID-19 was declared a global pandemic in March 2020. We all know that. We've all been living through it. It's still going on. Um, so prevention, diagnosis, and treatment of the newfound virus became a top priority. Um, due to the rapid spread of the virus, we we're kind of flying by the seat of our pants trying to find out what treatments um, would work. Um, so it's been theorized vitamin C, zinc, and vitamin D were theorized as possible treatments. Makes sense. They all kind of play a role in the immune system. Um, if you went to look about a year ago to find any of these products, it was impossible to find. They were all sold out everywhere. There was price gouging with it. Um, so people are trying to use the combination of vitamin C, zinc, and vitamin D. Um, and there is some belief to why vitamin D might play a role. Vitamin D receptors are found on the immune cells. You have your B cells and T cells, which are both types of lymphocytes or white blood cells, and their job is to attack any foreign substance in the body. They play a role in our immune system. So there is some theory of, you know, a good theory why vitamin D would help those patients who are diagnosed with COVID-19. And currently there's over 80 studies right now in the clinical trials page that I showed you that at 3,400, just on vitamin D and COVID alone. Uh, some of them are used to, um, whether you would at risk for infection or if you become infected and severity of disease, uh, morbidity and mortality associated with COVID-19. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go over a few published reports, which are all meta-analysis. So these are published reports for multiple studies um, regarding vitamin D use in COVID-19. Okay, so the first one is published by Munshi. Um, there were 376 patients in it, six studies, um, six studies um, that, that encompassed, and it studied the relationship between vitamin D levels and COVID-19 severity and prognosis. And so the studied severity of disease, low vitamin D was significantly associated with poor outcomes and prognosis. So what's the takeaway point? The takeaway point is, all right, low vitamin D, poor outcomes and prognosis, well, then maybe we should supplement with vitamin D could be helpful in assessing potential for developing severe disease. That seems to be, okay, good. However, we have another study by Pereira, I mean, another uh, published report, excuse me, not a study, that had 8,176 patients that encompassed 25 studies. And they looked at the link between vitamin D deficiency and prevalence, one, getting infected, and two, severity of disease if you do get infected. And vitamin D deficiency was not associated with development, sorry, Sorry, we have these lights in the pharmacy that shut off if there's no movement. So, um, or is that vitamin D deficiency was not associated with development of COVID-19 infection. Vitamin D deficiency was not associated with disease severity. So there was really no correlation. So there, this study um, showed that there was no support for vitamin D supplements to be used to prevent or reduce disease severity. And we have another study from Lou. Uh, which has 376,000 patients, large studies, 10 large studies involved in it. And this did not look at the severity of disease, it looked at the risk of getting infected. And so vitamin D deficiency was associated with an increased risk for COVID infection. COVID-19 infected patients had lower vitamin D levels than those not infected. So low vitamin D levels might be related to an increased risk for COVID-19. So if you see where I'm getting, it seems like I'm talking out of both sides of my mouth between different, all these different published reports that are coming out with vitamin D. One shows that vitamin D might help you um, prevent getting infected. Other one shows that it might help you with um, you know, illness if you do get infected. And then there's other studies that show no benefit whatsoever. And then we have another uh, published report, which is from Shah. And this examined the relationship between vitamin D supplements and the severity of COVID-19. Again, 532 patients, this only had three studies. They did notice lower ICU admission rate in those taking vitamin supplements versus those who weren't. However, there was no effect on mortality. So I don't even know what to make of this study. Um, possible use for vitamin D in reducing severity? Maybe. Um, it may keep you out of the ICU, but it didn't seem to do any effect on mortality, which is the most important you know, reason someone would supplement with vitamin D. So summary of vitamin D supplement use in COVID-19. Like I said, and like those four published reports, we're getting mixed results left and right. There's limited and conflicting evidence. And like I said before, there's 80 studies ongoing now with vitamin D in COVID-19. I can understand why people would be drawn to vitamin D. Um, 
especially, like I said, we're kind of flying by the seat of our pants when we first got hit with COVID, um, looking for anything. And all these trials were basically conducted in real time. Um, there wasn't really much um, we could go on by what was going on over in Asia or what was going on in Europe with the areas that were hit first. Um, can prove that low vitamin D levels lead to incidence of COVID-19 infection. Um, the studies may, I say do, but it's really may suggest that adequate vitamin D levels for taking vitamin may lead to better outcomes. But for every study that does show that, there's some that don't. So, um, and as National Institute of Health, the NIH, their COVID-19 treatment guidelines, or as of now, as of this date, like I said, there's still a bunch of studies um, going on right now. There's insufficient evidence for or against vitamin D for prevention or treatment of COVID-19. And even the UK, their National Institute for Health and Care Excellence, well, NICE, they don't recommend sole purpose of prevention and treatment of COVID-19 unless involved in a clinical trial. So they don't recommend vitamin D supplements unless you're involved in a trial um, for COVID-19. Vitamin D toxicity. Um, like I mentioned before, vitamin D um, is a fat soluble vitamin. It's uh, stored in fat tissue for an extended period of time, and the effects of toxicity may last for several months after stopping supplements. So like I mentioned before, vitamin D fat soluble, just like vitamin A, E, and K. Um, and I think we're taught, um, at least when pharmacy school, and I'm sure they're taught in medical school when I was researching the topic, that we're always scared of vitamin D toxicity. It's always something that we have to be concerned about. But however, it's one of the rarest medical conditions you'll ever find. Um, I put it, it's highly unlikely to get vitamin D toxicity from diet. I would almost put impossible um, because we only can get so much vitamin D from our diet anyway. Um, and the amounts of vitamin D that you would need to get toxic levels really only come from supplements. Um, the vitamin D produced from the sun can last twice as long in the body compared to vitamin D supplements. However, the body can regulate how much vitamin D it produces. So even if you're out in the sun or you go down to the south, you know, you're in Florida, some people we have like the snowbirds, they go down to Florida for six months or so. If you get more vitamin D um, during the winter months here, down there than you would up here, your body will be able to regulate the amount of vitamin D. You won't overdose from vitamin D from the sun. Um, your body will either get rid of or get um, the extra vitamin D that would produce, it would just let it degrade. Um, and like I said, seasonal variation in vitamin D levels will not lead to toxicity. So if somebody's taking a vitamin D supplement and then they travel to another location and they're getting um, vitamin D, you know, from the sun someplace closer to the equator, that would not push you into toxic levels. Uh, vitamin D toxicity, it's usually caused by intentional or inadvertent use of extremely high doses of supplements. So you're talking between 50,000 to 100,000 units a day for months to years. So this would be somebody who's not following up with a doctor, who's just going rogue, for lack of a better term, taking high doses of vitamin D. Vitamin D toxicity, signs and symptoms. Okay, so how would you know if you even are or have uh, high levels of vitamin D? Besides blood work, the symptoms usually associated with high are usually associated with high calcium levels. Nausea, vomiting, constipation, diarrhea, stomach pain, anorexia, weight loss. I mean, kidney failure would be something you would notice, but the other um, symptoms are pretty generic or pretty transient, stuff that people usually get most of the time, well, anorexia and weight loss, maybe not. But um, so there's really no way you would know you would have toxic vitamin D levels unless you actually do blood work. Just like you wouldn't know you're deficient in vitamin D unless you do blood work, you wouldn't really know that you have toxic blood levels unless you do the blood work. Um, and you see the quote there, worrying about vitamin D toxicity is like worrying about drowning when you're dying of thirst. Um, sometimes you gotta look, you know, like it's something we keep in mind, but it's something that's rarely going to happen. Um, and even then, blood levels would have to be over 150 nanograms per ml. We're already talking that most of the population is vitamin D deficient anyway. Just for reference earlier on, optimal levels of vitamin D, usually around 50 nanograms per ml, sufficient 30 nanograms per ml. So you would have to take really, really high doses of vitamin D supplements to get to vitamin D toxicity. So conclusions. So sun exposure, it's the most natural way to obtain vitamin D, and you will get vitamin D some way or other, but you really don't know how much you're gonna be getting. Like I said, going back to that intimidating slide that showed all the organic chemistry, um, sun exposure is gonna depend on where you're getting it, how long you're out there, how many days you're out there, how much of your body's covered, or how much of your body's exposed. Um, it's difficult to get optimum vitamin D levels from diet alone. 
Um, just because one, the diet that we eat here um, doesn't really, Americans are more a Western diet. They don't really have um, much fish in our diet. We generally go for more meat and carbohydrates, but even the Mediterranean diet, which is prom popular among Europeans, like I mentioned before, their 40% of the European population is considered vitamin D deficient as well. Um, so the easiest way to increase vitamin D levels are with supplements. Um, like I said, the USRDA went up from, it had been 400 units a day for a long time. Uh, it was now gone up, well, not now, but for the past few years, went up to 600 units a day and 800 units a day for patients greater than 70. Um, and that's just a recommended daily allowance. Like I said, that's not to treat a specific disease. Um, I know we mentioned the different types of cancer, COVID-19. Most of them are using higher doses. Some are using 2,000 to 5,000 units of vitamin D. Um, here in the pharmacy where I work, we have a lot of patients that get 50,000 units of vitamin D. They'll take it once a week, um, twice a week. We have some patients that get three times a week. Um, it depends on whatever their doctor, um, you know, whatever condition they're treating. Um, so these doses might seem a little low, um, but then again, this is just for like your average healthy um, individual that should be um, sufficient vitamin D. And so you should also get your vitamin D levels checked every three to six months and just be familiar with signs of vitamin D toxicity. Like I said, the symptoms are pretty nonspecific, um, but um, it's something to be aware of. There's the potential for it. There's been studies that show like they've had 10,000 10, people where they got maybe one person had vitamin D toxicity and they didn't even know it, even though their levels were off the chart. They had levels that were like um, toxicity is considered greater than 150. They've had patients that have vitamin D levels like 232, but they didn't even know that they were, you know, they had no signs and symptoms. The only way they knew it was through blood work. That's about it. Thank you for listening. Appreciate it. Thank you, Gerard. That was really extensive and thorough. That's wonderful information. Um, there are a few questions that came in. So I'm just gonna go over a few of them. Some of, most of them, I think you answered through your presentation already, but maybe just need some clarification. Sure. So one of them, I think um, there's a little bit of a confusion about oatmeal, um, okay. having vitamin D and were you um, referring to fortified, um, vitamin D fortified foods maybe? Oh, okay, yeah, that's in, um, try and get it back over here, sorry. Right here? Yeah. Okay, yeah, those are, I mean, you will get some vitamin um, D, it's actually usually like vitamin D2 that you'll get from your cereals. Um, like I said, oatmeal, Special K, Total, Multigrain Cheerios. Um, even, um, like I said, in the UK, Kellogg's UK in 2018, increased their vitamin D levels by 50%. And even if you go into the supermarket now and you check most of them, a lot of them will tell you that now more vitamin D. Um, you do get vitamin D from your cereals, but you're not gonna get that much, to be honest with you. Vitamin D from the diet is pretty limited. Um, even like I said, oily fish, a serving of salmon, herring, trout, maybe you'll get like 200 to 250 units, if that, uh, from those meals. And that would be something that obviously you could just get that in a capsule or a tablet, you know, July. not that I'm promoting um, vitamin D supplements, but it's more, not exact is the word I'm looking for, but it, it's, uh, how's the word I'm looking for? Um, it's not as variable as with vitamin, with the uh, diet, depending on what you're going to get, you know, in terms of um, your vitamin D level from um, diet alone. Okay. Thank you. Um, there's another question about vitamin D and um, vitamin K2 in particular together. Okay. And also if it needs to be taken, you know, together and also if it needs, if they need magnesium together with that or. Yeah, there's some studies that show vitamin D and vitamin K because one could deplete the other. So you would take both of them together. Um, just check with vitamin D and um, vitamin K because vitamin K is used for clotting as well. So I would check with your doctor. Um, you can also get vitamin K from like your green leafy vegetables. It's actually probably easier to get vitamin K from diet than it is vitamin D. Um, in terms of magnesium, sometimes they'll come combined calcium, vitamin D and magnesium. Um, magnesium as well. It's also kind of, there's also an overlap of um, the conditions you're trying to treat. A lot of people will use magnesium to help um, with muscle cramps as well. So you will see sometimes a combination of calcium, vitamin D and magnesium together. 
Um, they don't have to be taken together, but generally they're all kind of being used to treat the same symptoms. So that's the reason why you might see the, them together. Um, all right, I'm just looking at the other questions here, George. And what about um, summertime? Do they have okay. to adjust I'm whatever? Sorry? Do they have to adjust what they're taking depending on the season or? Um, they could. I mean, this is where if you're um, monitoring your vitamin D levels, you might be able to adjust and kind of like take a lower supplement or even get off a supplement depending on. Um, but like I said, there's a lot of variables when you're getting your vitamin D from sunlight. How long are you out there? How much of your body is exposed? It's easier in the summer if you're wearing shorts and T-shirt as opposed to the winter. Um, where are you in the summer? If you're down in, you know, Mexico or someplace close to the equator, Florida, it's good. You're going to get a lot more vitamin D than you would be if you're in New Jersey or Boston or North. Um, so you really wouldn't know your body won't, you won't overdose on vitamin D. So you don't have to worry about falling into a toxic level. Say you're taking vitamin D, um, 50,000 units. I'm just using the prescription, for example, once a week, if you go down to Florida, you wouldn't have to worry about going into a toxic level if you end up doing more activities outside. Um, like I said, the body will either degrade the extra vitamin D. The body is able to maintain kind of form a um, homeostasis, like the body is able to regulate its own vitamin D levels. So there is the potential that you might be able to lower your vitamin D, um, but the only way you're really going to know is unless you get blood work drawn. Thank you. And I think um, that was very clear from your presentation, but there was a few questions regarding that about okay. self-supplementation um, yeah. without getting um, their level. Well, also, like, a, yeah, a lot of people nowadays, I mean, like I said, 90% uh, of our lives are inside, especially this past year. A lot of people are homebound. A lot of people are working from home, so they're not even getting the, you know, benefits of, it, you know, even going outside for a commute or something like that. A lot of people aren't getting the sun, um, you know, in their daily activities. So a lot of people will rely on a supplement. I can understand why people would not, not that they don't want to take it, but they'd rather do things the more natural way. That was why I kind of put the study up um, showing with the milk and sunlight. There are some people who are very anti-pill or anti-supplement. And I get that they want to do things the natural way. And that's fine. Uh, just you might end up being deficient in vitamin D. And no matter sometimes how much vitamin D or how much sun, you know, you're out, you know, you'd also don't want to which is one of the things to worry about is that you spend too much time in the sun and then you end up developing a risk of skin cancer, you know, because either whether you're not using a SPF, a sun protectant or something like that, um, you know. Yeah, I guess, cause some, some questions that came in were about um, titrating their own doses, dosages and right. um, supplementing mm -hmm. themselves um, right. on their own independently. Right. You suggest that they get have a base baseline. Right. Yeah. Baseline of vitamin D just from like regular daily activities. And if you're going to supplement, like I said, the US uh, RDA is like 600 units of vitamin D. It had been 400 forever, um, but they increased to 600 because they feel like that's better in terms of what they know vitamin D will do in terms of strengthening bones, you know, that we don't get the brittle bones. Um, so they upped that a few years ago up to 600 units of vitamin D. So you can still take 600 units of vitamin D and still, um, do your daily activities outside in the sun and you won't be at risk for toxicity. I mean, and like I said, each person is different on how they're going to metabolize um, or how they're going to produce the vitamin D that they get from the sun, you know, um, depends on their skin tone, depends on their skin. As they get older, the, thin, um, the skin, excuse me, starts to thin. We're not able to produce vitamin D as efficiently as we are. Also, um, our liver and our kidneys don't work as well as they used to. So we may not be able to create um, active vitamin D in the blood as, or as efficiently and get as high levels as we'd like, or as we used to. All right, the other question that came in is, um, are generics as effective as name brands when it comes to vitamin D supplements? Yeah, I mean, these aren't regulated by the FDA. Um, they're regulated, you know, they're marketed as food supplements. So you might have anybody, I mean, I understand where people will feel comfortable using a Caltrade um, or a Citrical, um, as opposed to some generic company they never heard of, or they don't like where it was manufactured, I've heard. But um, they are what they are supposed to be, at least as it says on the label. Um, it might be more a placebo effect than anything else, but I mean, my parents get their vitamin D and calcium 
Costco, so they use the Kirkland brand. <laughs> so, um, you know, I can't say for sure um, whether, you know, it might be a more placebo effect, but I mean, if it says it's calcium 600 plus D or it's vitamin D, you know, 1,000, 2,000, 5,000 units, I mean, that's what's in the product. Um, some people might have an allergic reaction to not even the vitamin D, but it could be like an inactive ingredient. It could be something in the tablet. It could be a buffer, something that holds the tablet together. So, I mean, if you find a, you know, reputable generic, I think there's nothing wrong with that. Um, you know, like Nature's Bounty, Windmill, um, Kirkland's brand of vitamins, there shouldn't be an issue. I mean, if people want to spend more money, I have no problem. I don't tell people how to spend their money, um, but if they feel comfortable taking Caltrade, I mean, what I would recommend though, is somebody starts on one, I would continue on that. Um, just like we do with patients in the prescription with thyroid medications, um, we like to keep them on the same company. That way we know whether we have to increase the dose or decrease the dose. We don't have to worry about any like intervariability between switching between the different uh, manufacturers. All right. There's a question about vitamin D and PPIs. Okay. Um, does it um, affect- PPI, yep, sorry. Does it affect your vitamin um, D levels? And maybe you can just um, clarify what PPI is for everyone. Okay, so PPI is a proton pump inhibitor. That's like your Prilosec, Nexium. Um, they're the most prescribed um, class of prescription drugs. Um, it seems like everyone is taking them. Um, Nexium was the number one. Prilosec was the number one drug. And then when they were losing the patent, Nexium became the number one drug. So what they've noticed is, and I mentioned this once in my other vitamin supplements before, they noticed that patients who are on PPIs might have a decreased risk, I'm sorry, um, might be vitamin D deficient. However, um, like I mentioned in this um, presentation numerous times, 42% of the population is vitamin D deficient anyway. So I can't say for sure that taking a PPI will make you vitamin D deficient because one, like I said, a lot of people take them, um, whether they get a prescription or they can buy them over the counter, buy Nexium 24, Prilosec OTC. Um, there does seem to be those who take proton pump inhibitors do have lower levels of vitamin D, but I can't say for sure that there's a causal relationship between the two. Okay. Um, there is another question that came in. I think you went over um, right now that there's no specific um, recommendation yet between COVID and mm -hmm. vitamin D supplementation. Right. right? This was, this is just a question about if you do get COVID, does it decrease vitamin D levels? And I don't know if there's any studies on that yet because we're still early. Yeah, the um, I can't, sorry, this light went off again. I apologize. <laughs> um, I haven't heard that to be honest with you. Most of these studies that have done with COVID have, are kind of like retrospective and that We've given these medications, you know, while patients are either, you know, I mean, COVID's only been around since what, uh, December 2019. So we we're only dealing with it for almost 18, well, we've been dealing with it for 18 months, but um, it really didn't come to this country until about March or April or so we think, or it might've been come up sooner. But um, I can't say for sure if COVID actually lowers vitamin D levels. Um, it seems like the studies that are ongoing now is more like patients having low vitamin D levels before getting COVID. Or do you supplement with vitamin D if you get COVID or to prevent you from getting COVID? So um, like I said, when I showed that clinicaltrials.gov site, um, there's over 80 trials going on right now between COVID and vitamin D. Um, I'd have to look that up, to be honest with you. I don't want to speculate and give an answer. Um, but right now, I don't think there's data that shows that COVID lowers vitamin D levels. Um, most of the emphasis has been on patients supplementing with vitamin D, um, like I said, to either prevent getting COVID or if they do get COVID to prevent um, severity of disease. Uh, another question is, does sunscreen block vitamin D? So, yes. So your sunscreen, your vitamin D production comes from your ultraviolet B, your UVB light that you get from the sun. So that's another variable thrown into the equation. You want some people to get sun exposure, but you don't want to get too much. And if you're using a sunscreen, depending on where you're applying it, you don't really know how much vitamin D your body's gonna be able to produce. So yeah, sunscreen can affect your vitamin D levels, absolutely. And that's also the theory, well, it's not the theory, um, why we noticed that patients who have um, darker skin tone, the melanin, um, the melanin actually kind of acts as a sunscreen for patients. So they don't get as much vitamin D levels from the sun. 
Okay. I think they should, um, we have a question that came in that just needed to clarify something about uh, PPIs. That okay. If you're taking Nexium or Prilosec, will that lower their vitamin D level? Um, that I can't say for sure. Like I said, I know that they've studied proton pump inhibitors and Nexium Prilosec. Um, and they do notice that these are medications that people do take long term. Um, it's usually not used like episodic. Um, it seems like when people are on them, they're on them pretty much for life um, or take them for an extended period of time. Um, I don't want to speculate on that. So if I would happily give my email out if somebody wants and they can ask me and I'll, I'd rather get uh, give them the right answer than just speculate. Yeah. Yes, thank you. Um, is there... There is another question here. There are supplements with calcium and magnesium together. I recently heard that you sh it should be spaced out mm -hmm. um, if you're taking calcium and magnesium. Um, there's one theory that because your body is getting both of them at the same time, they both might not be absorbed. Um, calcium on its own, usually um, that's why you kind of take high doses. Um, it can cause like gas, bloating, upset stomach and stuff like that. Um, but they do come combination together. So there is the potential that the two of them taken at the same time, um, they might interfere with the absorption of the other. But um, I don't know if that's going to affect your blood levels of that. Um, that makes any sense. Um, you could break them up if possible. Um, ideally, most of the time, though, with calcium, you do try and take it with food because it does give you those GI side effects. And the same thing with magnesium. So um, I really wouldn't know unless you actually drew blood levels to see if whether one is going to interfere with the other. But as yeah, as um, sometimes you will see calcium, magnesium, vitamin D all together in one tablet. So Right. Okay. I think there is another, there's a few other questions here. What foods... Um, I think they needed to, clarification on if vitamin D was um, water soluble or not. Now, vi now vitamin D is fat soluble. So mm -hmm. like I said, it's the, um, your fat soluble vitamins are your vitamin A, D, E, and K. So those vitamins get stored in um, your fat tissue in the body. So there's also the theory, and that was like kind of what I mentioned with obesity, that if patients have more fat in the body, then they should have more vitamin D levels. But we've, shown, but we've shown that obesity, actually obese patients seem to have lower vitamin D levels, but vitamin D is a actual fat soluble vitamin. Okay. And then are there any foods that you should take when you take your vitamin D pill? Um, I would just now, I mean, it's fine just to have something in the stomach to protect the stomach. Some people will find vitamin D can irritate the stomach or irritate the lining of the stomach. Um, that's why they come so many different, there's soft gel capsules, tablets, there's the gummies, which are very popular. Um, there's melt away, there's chewable. Um, it doesn't really make a difference. Not, um, by, by eating, um, just taking with food, you're gonna have, you're gonna increase the acidity in your stomach anyway. So it should give you higher levels of vitamin D. Hopefully it would be absorbed better, but there's no specific food you would need to take with it. Okay, there's a few questions here where they are already on vitamin D supplements um, and, and if they should still get tested or I guess, you know, the intervals for, for blood level testing. I mean, um, you would, like I said, when usually you initiate vitamin D therapy, usually, um, you know, the doctor will do your blood work, um, depending how often you see them and do your blood work. They'll usually recommend like three months to six months. But I mean, if you see your physician once a year, I, that should be adequate enough to measure your vitamin D levels. Um, like I said, we, we're concerned about vitamin D toxicity, I think more in our mind than actually it really happens. So, um, and like I showed on one of the slides, you would have, you have to taking mega doses of vitamin D and basically not seeing a physician, not getting blood work um, for months and years actually down the line before you would actually notice toxicity. So um, I, I would continue just doing blood work regularly, whatever your regular interval is. I wouldn't do anything specific. I wouldn't have to get it done every three months because it takes a while before you get vitamin D levels. Um, before you notice an effect with vitamin D levels. Because like I said, they're stored in the fat anyway, so it kind of gets released. Um, not like a rainy day fund, but you know your body knows when to release vitamin D. And so it might take a while before you notice any appreciable 
you know, notice in your blood levels. All right, there's a few questions here about uh, vitamin um, D supplementation and calcium supplementation and their age. Okay. Is there any, um, or is, is the, are the dosages individualized versus more related to uh, the specific age group? This is how much- I mean, it's usually recommended. The vitamin, the cal like I mentioned before with um, the calcium and vitamin D, the calcium level, the calcium strength has stayed the same throughout. It's usually been 600 milligrams of calcium. And then it's the vitamin D component that's increased. Um, years ago, it used to be 600 calcium, 200 units of vitamin D. Then it was 600 units, I'm sorry, 600 milligrams of calcium. Then they increased it to 400 units of vitamin D. But if you go today to buy Citrocal um, and it's 600 plus D, it will be 600 units of, um, 600 milligrams of calcium and 800 units of vitamin D. And that's usually what they recommend. It's usually going to be cal, um, Caltrate or Citrocal or oyster shell calcium. It's usually going to be around 500 to 600 units of uh, calcium and then 800 units of vitamin D. Um, like I mentioned before, though, just double check with the product that you're taking. Um, sometimes you'll have to take like the gummies or you might have to take, depending on the manufacturer, um, you might have to take one or, you know, two tablets in place of one to get the amount of calcium and vitamin D. So just look at the serving size on the label. They even make a Citrocal, um, which is a once a day, um, which gives you 1200 milligrams of calcium, gives you enough vitamin D, you just take it once a day. But just make sure you take two at the same time, because otherwise you would think it was just once a day and one pill. So usually recommend calcium 600 plus D. All right. It doesn't matter really age. Um, they usually just recommend that for most patients, um, postmenopausal, elderly. And then sometimes they'll even supplement with the prescription vitamin D on top of that if needed, or take an extra vitamin D, 400 units or, you know, vitamin D comes in so many different strengths, so you can play around with it a lot. All right. Well, I think one last question, Gerard, because I know we're up to that um, time already. Is there a specific time where they should take their supplement, day versus evening? No, I mean, it's not like we worry about like, like cholesterol medications and stuff like that. I mean, these are supplements that are going to be taking long term anyway. So as long as you try and take them the same time every day, um, most of vitamin Ds or vitamin D combination with calcium, we generally would take with food. So if you're taking it once a day, you could take it, you know, in the morning after breakfast or take in the evening after dinner. Compliance is the main issue. So whatever is going to work better for the patient. Um, you know, I know we recommend with certain cholesterol medications, you take them at night because your body produces more cholesterol at night. Certain antihypertensives we recommend at night because most patients will get blood pressure surges or heart attacks in the morning. So you want the drug at the highest level. But with these supplements, um, one, it takes a while before it's in your system anyway, but I would just take whatever is going to I would just take it the easiest way you're going to remember to take it. So if, you know, it's busy running around in the morning, you want to just take it, you know, in the evening after dinner, after a snack, that's fine. There's no real benefit to taking one in the morning or, you know, time of day. Thank you, Gerard. Thank you're you welcome. so much. Thank you so much for your informative presentation this evening. As I've mentioned in my introduction of Gerard, he's available here. He's the pharmacist in charge of our Valley Health Pharmacy here in Mawa. So he is very available, you know, and can answer more questions if there are, you know, if you have other specific questions for him. At this and, time, I'd like to, uh, is there anything you want to add? Troy? Well, I was just going to say, if anyone had a question, if they don't want to walk in or come into the building, my email is G, like my first initial, Tui, T, like my last name, G, Tui at valleyhealth.com. If you have a question and I'll be happy to answer it and, you know. If I don't know the answer, I'll try and look it up in the Drug Information Center at the hospital and try and get back to you. Yeah, thank you. It's okay. very helpful. At this